Cherubs, more than a decade ago, I remember having a conversation with another early modernist about William Blake. Both of us kind of agreed that we never really understood the appeal. My friend proposed a hypothesis. He said, I think that the art historians look at his prints and go, well, I guess he's a pretty good poet. And then the poets read his poetry and unimpressed sort of say, well, he must be a really good printmaker. And because of his reputation, maybe both sides are kind of afraid to admit that he's just not that interesting. But now I'm 40. I've got to question some of those opinions that I once had. And generally, I know that the more I learn about something and listen to people who care about something, the more I can find care in that thing and the more sympathetic to that opinion I can become. So in the tradition of the art assignment, I read a bunch of stuff about William Blake. I read a bunch of William Blake's poetry. I looked at a lot of his prints. And now I'm ready to make the case for William Blake. And if engaging with art in meaningful ways seem like your kind of thing, please consider subscribing and checking out my Patreon in the link below. Let's get into it. So William Blake was an English printmaker, poet, and painter. He was born in 1757 to a working class parents and died without fanfare in 1827 buried in an unmarked grave. He's typically classified as a romantic thinker, but I've come to think that a better way to classify him is by asking the same question that the English lawyer Henry Crabb Robinson asked after meeting Blake at a dinner party. He asked, shall I call him an artist or genius or mystic or madman? That is to say, the best way to categorize him is to not categorize him, ask a question instead. But beyond those metaphysical labels and questions, he made his living working at a printing press. In that work, he collaborated with a publisher who printed works by some politically radical thinkers like Thomas Paine and Mary Wollstonecraft. So that is to say, he was exposed to revolutionary thinkers during his day job. Having the access and skills for this work, he also printed his own material. He printed some of his own poetry, some prints, sometimes a combination of both, like his often cited Songs of Innocence and his later Songs of Experience. Those were visual works that combined visual compositions with his poetry. And it's like actually not that difficult to love his prints. I don't know what I was thinking when I was in my 20s. These are engaging. They're filled with life. They're just weird enough to keep my attention. I think I was just totally invested in Renaissance art 15 years ago and then later became totally invested in contemporary art. And I guess I just never realized how interesting the stuff in between might be. I ignored it to my own peril. Unfortunately, the people of London during his lifetime also ignored it. Like during his lifetime, he sold less than 30 copies of these works. He was buried in an unmarked grave and nobody really took notice. But a lot has changed since his death. In 2018, for example, close to a thousand people showed up just to see a new grave marker in his final resting place be revealed at Bunhill Fields. And in late 2019, just before the pandemic, the Tate Modern hosted a retrospective of his work attended by over a quarter million people. And it seems pretty universally beloved. So it seems like I'm not the only one who's come around on Blake lately. So to tell the story of how I got to this place of liking Blake, I want to not start with William Blake directly, but a work that William Blake inspired. This is a sculpture outside the British Library by Eduardo Palazzi, inspired by a William Blake print. Now part of why I like this sculpture is that I have nothing but fond memories of the year that I spent visiting this library every single day, and this sculpture conjures those memories of the lifestyle that I had as a young master student in this city. Newton's focused pursuit of knowledge in this representation is a good reminder of that year. I liked seeing it every day, and my enjoyment of the sculpture was uncomplicated. It's a sculpture illustrating the pursuit of knowledge outside of a library. What is not to like about that? Well, I did a little bit more reading, and having read a lot more Blake, I've learned that there are plenty of people who love William Blake who also have very complicated feelings about this sculpture. Apparently, it's not as simple as I thought. It rarely is, to be fair. So, to explain those complications, the original print that this is based on is colorful, energetic, and mysterious. Newton sits in some vague landscape that looks like he's underwater or in some cave that might appear in a fantasy novel. He's sitting on a rock formation that seems custom made for his body. It's like a totally wild scene. But the sculpture, however, looks mechanical. 
Palazzi did not attempt to hide the individual sheets of metal that define Newton's body. He's visibly being held together by bolts, and he sits on a box that I imagine is modeled off of the type of box that holds files. So the print and the sculpture are different in a lot of ways, and in my research, plenty of Blake scholars think that this sculpture, and its location outside of a library, represents a misreading of Blake's original print. Apparently, the illustration by Blake is not the celebration of Newton that the sculpture seems to think it is. I'll try to explain that. So this image of Newton, Blake's image, has him in some sort of otherworldly landscape, naked and holding a compass. It seems that he is either measuring a circle inscribed on a piece of parchment or he's mapping out his own circle. Either way, it is clear that he is intensely focused on this task and completely unaware of his surroundings. He cares much more about what he's working on than what he's sitting on, for example. Like, Newton's focus here is reminiscent, for me, of that famous tale told about Archimedes. When the Romans sieged his hometown, Archimedes had been working on a geometric proof, and when confronted by the soldiers who were there to kill him, he said, Do not disturb my circles seemingly unaware of the events happening around him, caring only about his geometry. Similarly, Newton ignores the fascinating world around him in this image. It looks like he's sitting on a coral or something, like he's underwater and yet his scrolls don't seem to get wet. It's an extremely confusing setting, and I think it's literally awesome. Like, it inspires awe. And Newton, rather than sit with that wonder, rather than let his imagination run wild with it, he attempts to confine this landscape's mysteriousness to the categories and rules of his rational mind. He's trying to use his mathematics to explain the unexplainable, to give a language to the ineffable. So, the argument goes, picturing Newton in this way is kind of a dig at Newton. Like, Blake is critical of Newton's narrowly focused rationality. This image is similar to John Keats's verse that says Newton's philosophy will clip an angel's wings, conquer all mysteries by rule and line. The criticism here is that Newton's rationality suffocates imagination. Like, you need to have both, but what Newton represents in the cultural imagination is pure rationality. This, of, of course, doesn't actually explain the real Isaac Newton, who was a very complicated man and also a very mystical thinker, but Newton has come to represent in our like, cultural imagination a pure rational mind, and that's what we're dealing with here, the world of symbols. And Newton, though a real man, is also a symbol. So like, if we think about rationality and imagination and we want to picture them as competing for epistemological significance, Newton would be symbolic of rationality, and that's what he's doing here. And Blake, in his more philosophic works, often articulated this concept of double vision. It's here that I should note that William Blake famously had visions, like he saw angels, he was visited by ghosts, he once got into a fight with a thistle because the thistle took the side of some ghosts who he saw earlier in his walk, and those ghosts wanted him to turn around. He didn't want to turn around, and so he kicked the thistle. These visions, when he describes them, he makes them sound like they're some sort of augmented reality experience, and they persisted throughout his life. So he saw the world as it is, but then on top of that, he saw another world layered on top of it. The world of meaning, the world of spirituality, angels, ghosts, majestic underwater landscapes, perhaps. It's actually pretty easy to see his articulation of this experience as a totally reasonable understanding of the way that our beliefs and language interact with the physical reality of the world. There is the stuff that exists, that we perceive with our senses, and then layered on top of that is the way that we feel about that same stuff, the stories that we tell about that stuff, and how the language we use to categorize or label that stuff is connotated in certain ways. This is a sort of double vision. So Newton's attempt at categorizing and labeling the world around him is only one way of seeing the world, and according to Blake, a deeply limiting way of seeing it. Notice how there are no perfect triangles or perfect circles in this image except for the ones that Newton is creating. This image seems to imply that any attempt to parse the physical world into categories in order to study it will have its limitations. This understanding of Blake's image of Newton is supported by an earlier illustration by Blake called The Ancient of Days. The subject of this image is a character from Blake's mythology named Urizen. That's right, Blake had his own mythological system. There's an entire system of belief in a cast of characters, and they appear throughout his prints and poetry. It's kind of like J.R.R. Tolkien or C.S. Lewis or the, the Avengers franchise. 
He's a myth maker. He created a cosmology of his own. And Urizen, the focus of this print, is one of the main characters in Blake's mythology. In this mythology, he's one part of a primordial being named Albion. Urizen is the part of Albion that embodies reason and law. He is the part of us that separates the world into small parts in order to understand it better. The part that creates categories and binary oppositions, and then takes our sensory experience and tries to put them into those categories. In this image, Urizen bursts out of a giant golden orb, a giant sun, and he's so focused on his own act of creation with his oversized compass that he's ignoring the magnificent light behind him. Moreover, his presence in this print is preventing us from fully seeing that light as well. Pure reason, this seems to say, can be so focused on its own ability to construct worlds that it both ignores and obstructs the magnificence of pre-existing creations. It limits our ability to see the wonders of reality. So thus far, I've given a pretty negative view of this Urizen Newton character. I've focused on his limitations, the insights that he prevents. But obviously, if you just look at these prints, they aren't overtly critical of these characters. Urizen looks epic in the Ancient of Days print, jumping out of that orb. And I can't help but find something noble in Newton's focused attention here. These characters are not actually represented negatively. Like seeking explanations for the world or using the tools available to us, like our rationality, like the language that we use to categorize the world, that's not a bad thing. Like learning more about Blake actually allows me to care more about him. Like learning more about the physical world can help us care more about it. And that's actually an important point for Blake. Urizen is not something regrettable, not something to be eliminated. Newton is not a villain. Urizen in Blake's mythology is a creator. Reason, law, language, those little categories that we put things into when we name them, these form the world that we live in. They're important ways of understanding the nature of reality. The name of this print, The Ancient of Days, it comes from a word used to describe God in the book of Daniel. Urizen is a creator like God is a creator. But Urizen, even though he's the Ancient of Days, often plays a part similar to that of Satan in Blake's mythology the temptation of our own rational abilities, the pursuit of knowledge. He's got parts of God in him, but he's also got parts of Satan in him. So this figure exists beyond our usual good and evil binary. He's not just a God or just Satan, because he's both of those things. Like take his name, for example, Urizen. It kind of sounds like I'm saying your reason, Urizen. But it also kind of sounds like I'm saying horizon, which means limit. These characters in these images engage us with brilliant focus acts of creation, the godlike abilities of our reason, the undeniable creative power of Newton's equations, while also showing us the limitations of this act of creation. That undeniable power, it's not everything. It has limits. It's only one part of our experience. Urizen, your reason, it has limits. So this print isn't just a dig at Newton like some might claim. It's not that simple. There's a lot of ambiguity here. And Eduardo Palazzi, the sculptor, says that he's aware of this ambiguity and his sculpture outside the BL is intended to bring Newton and Blake together. He defends the statue by saying that, while Blake may have been satirizing Newton, I see this work as an exciting union of two British geniuses. Together, they present to us nature, science, poetry, art, architecture, all welded, interconnected, interdependent. And yeah, that makes sense to me. I mean, Blake is a symbol of imagination and Newton is a symbol of rationality, two British geniuses welded together. But I think there's a more complicated justification to be made as well. If this image of Newton shows the important act of creation through rationality, while also positioning the viewer to see the limitations of the reason that Newton can't, then the critics are still kind of right. It is a little ironic to put this in front of the British Library to turn Blake into a symbol for poetry in order to emphasize the way that Blake tried to show the limitations of these categorical distinctions does in fact seem misguided. So I think the better argument would be to lean into that irony and say that placing the sculpture outside the British Library encourages readers to accept the limits of their studies as they're about to engage in them. Go and be Newton. Focus on your little books inside that grand building. That work is actually important, but it's not the only thing. Don't let those books blind you to your own imagination. 
Don't let the stuff that you learn about and can apply language to distract you from the stuff that exists beyond your ability to categorize it and confine it with language. Make room for what you cannot control and what you cannot understand. William Blake encourages us to see the world complexly. Reason and imagination shouldn't be thought of as in competition with each other, but as necessary parts of a greater whole. And this insight has been central to me finding a way to love William Blake. He sees binary categories for what they are, incomplete, dependent on each other, necessarily existing simultaneously and often cooperatively. He can link a character like Urizen with Satan and God simultaneously. And this is a characteristic that many of my favorite authors and artists have. They show us complicated, limited, and flawed characters, and then show us how to love them. In the case of William Blake, he's able to do this with his viewers, with his readers. We see in Blake's prints the complicated tensions in our own understanding of the world. And if we look closely, we can find a way to see both our rational and irrational beliefs side by side and view them both with care and love. So that's the story of how I found a way to love William Blake, the visual artist. I'm going to actually return to Blake soon with a video about his poetry, so subscribe if you want to be notified when that video is released. And now that I'm saying it out loud, I'm realizing that I've treated the study of William Blake as Urizen would. I've split him into two parts, printmaker and poet. He's not two things, though. He's one William Blake who contains multitudes, and the poetry interacts with the prints. So when I do that poetry video, I will be sure to include the prints in that as well. Thank you for watching.